Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Hyde Seventh-day Adventist Church to our adult Sabbath school class. I'm joined today with my wife, Rebecca Morgan, and we're going to be studying about the Bible and prophecy. And so um, we look forward to um, a great lesson. I think it's just a wonderful uh, information. Uh, just a couple of quick uh, updates for you. We are meeting in person today, uh, June 13th, Sabbath, at the 11 o'clock hour. Face masks are required. Social distancing is required. And contact tracing is required. We will be collecting basic information just in case someone comes down with the COVID virus so that we can contact you easily. This will be our second Sabbath when we've been open, when our doors have been open. It was very successful last week, and we anticipate it being uh, as successful or more successful this coming week, this Sabbath. Um, Marcos, as Mamo, uh, Marcos will have our sermon today and uh, in just a little while, and I know that you'll enjoy it and be blessed. Meanwhile, I'd like to add that the drive through will be happening at between 11 and 12 from now on instead of one to two. So if you want to participate in the drive through to drop off your offerings, your tithe, or to pick up any Sabbath school materials, come between 11 and 12. Very good. Rebecca, um, let's go ahead and open with prayer and I'm going to, then I'll ask you to read the um, memory text. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just ask that your Holy Spirit will be with us you will guide us and direct us as we study your word together. We're thankful for the Bible. We're thankful for prophecy. And we pray, O oh Lord, that you uh, will open our minds and hearts, so it says in Luke 24, to receive your word. And we pray that uh, Jesus will be with us. Your Holy Spirit will be with us as we study together. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So our scripture text, and memory text, if you could read that for us. It's Daniel 8, 14. The King James Version says, And he said unto me, And to 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Very good. So we see here one of the most famous verses in all of Adventism, straight from God's Word, the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 8 and verse 14. And we're going to get into the meaning of that shortly. It says, Bible prophecy is crucial to our identity and mission. Prophecy provides an internal and external mechanism to confirm the accuracy of God's word. Jesus said, and now I've told you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you may believe. Speaking directly about prophecy. By the way, just a reminder, in John 5, 39, Jesus said, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. We will see over and over again, particularly as we study Bible prophecy, that it testifies of Jesus Christ. One reason why Seventh-day Adventists emphasize prophecy so much, but Bible prophecy is that it predicts, it projects uh, when Jesus, and that the fact that Jesus is coming, and he's, he will be coming right on time. Mm -hmm. The great hope, the Apostle Paul calls the, uh, the second coming of Christ the great hope. It says here, this presents a crucial question. How do we interpret prophecy correctly so that we may know so we know when the prophecy has indeed come to pass. Great question. Uh, how do we do that? There are many different ways that other denominations, other churches interpret prophecy. How does Seventh-day Adventists do it, and how do we know that it's correct? Well, let's take a look. During the Reformation, the Reformers followed the historicist method. The Reformers, the Protestant Reformers, Seventh-day Adventists, we consider ourselves Protestant Reformers, right? We protested against the teachings, the false teachings of the church uh, during the time during the Middle Ages, during the Dark Ages. This method, this historicist method, is the same one that Daniel and John used as the key of their own interpretation. What do you think that means, that they use that? Well, I think that it's very important that not only what we see happening in the world is uh, according to God's will, but he also shows us what will happen beforehand. So not only is it uh, to show that he knows the end from the beginning, the beginning from the end, but to uh, explain and build our faith. There you go. I like that. 
And I think that the historicist method is, is the one that really makes the most sense. Well, yes. And it's perhaps, perhaps the, the simplest method to understand. It says the historicist method sees prophecy as a progressive and continuous fulfillment of history. So if you've studied high school history, for example, or college history, um, you can world see history. world history. <laughs> you can go back to Daniel's time, for example. Daniel did, lived in the time of Babylon, lived in the time of Medo-Persia. And that you you know what what uh, actual uh, uh, nations or empires followed after. So we've got Babylon, then we got Medo Persia, then we've got Greece, then we've got Rome, right? And, and then, then the fragmentation. Then that's right. You've got Papal Rome, then you've got the divided Europe, and then you've got the Second Coming of Christ. It's a very simple progression, um, starting in the, in the past and ending with the God's eternal kingdom. Moving on to, over to Sunday's lesson, it says here, the foundational method the Seventh-day Adventists apply for studying prophecy is called historicism. It's the idea that many of the major prophecies in the Bible follow an unbroken linear flow of history from past to present and then to future. Now, these words are chosen carefully. When it says linear, it's a straight line. There's a beginning point and there's an ending point. There are some people, as a matter of fact, majority of the evangelical world, although it used to be historicist, now they believe there are gaps in the, in and they the, jump. In the biblical. They jump from one place to the other, and it takes a stretch of the imagination. It's much easier, I believe, to grasp the historicist, the linear view of prophecy. It's similar to how you might study history in school. We do that this way because it is how the Bible itself interprets these prophecies. It says, read Daniel 2 verses 27 to 45. What aspects of the dream given to Nebuchadnezzar indicate a continuous, uninterrupted succession of powers throughout history? Now, to save time, we're not going to read this, but most of you all are familiar with the dream that he had. King Nebuchadnezzar was asleep on his bed, the Bible says, and he had this dream, and it bothered him. It disturbed him. When he woke up, he could not remember the details, only that it was very important and made a strong impression on his mind. He called for his soothsayers, the magicians, the so-called wise men, to come and give him the interpretation. Well, they were called wise men for a reason. They said, oh, king, live forever. You tell us what the dream is, and we'll tell you what the interpretation is. Well, King Nebuchadnezzar was the king of this vast empire for a reason. He was smart. He says, you guys are just trying to pull my leg. If you're so wise, you tell me the dream and then the interpretation. And they said, oh, king, live forever. No man can do that. And so the king ordered them all to be destroyed. Uh, but there was one that could. There was one that could, and that was Daniel. The Bible says that Daniel and his friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael, they all got together. And they got down on their knees and they prayed. And they asked the Lord for wisdom for him to reveal the secrets. And then Daniel was, uh, was brought in but before the king, and what happened? As for you, O king, thoughts came to your mind while on your bed about what would come to pass after this. And he who reveals secrets has made known to you what will be. But as for me, this secret has not been revealed to me because I have more wisdom than anyone living, but for our sakes who make known the interpretation to the king that you may know the thoughts of your heart. You, O king, were watching and behold a great image. Uh, and then we have the image uh, of gold, uh, uh, the chest and arms of silver, the bellies and thighs uh, of uh, the belly and thighs of bronze, the iron legs, the feet partly of iron and partly of clay. And um, Daniel says, "This is the dream." Now we will tell you the interpretation. So it not only was Daniel shown the dream that he could tell it, but now he's going to give the king the lesson of the dream. That's right. He said, thou, O king, are the head of gold. So the head of gold represented Babylon because thou, O king, King Nebuchadnezzar, he was the king of Babylon. So the first nation or the first kingdom was Babylon. And then following that is Medo-Persia. That's actually identified right there. After you shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours, and then another, a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. There you go. And then, of course, 
so you have Medo Persia, so Babylon, Medo Persia, Greece, Rome, and then this stone cut out without hands. That we, well, you'd have divided Europe, which is the uh, metal and the clay, iron and clay mixed together. And it says, in the days of these kings, read that, verse 44. Uh, well, I would like to read this. And you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay. They will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another, just as iron does not mix with clay. And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. So you can see that the Bible is following the historicist method of interpretation. It's linear. It has a starting point. It has an ending point. It starts in the days of Daniel, starts in the days of King Nebuchadnezzar, and it ends at the second coming of Jesus Christ, where actually it's a new beginning because Christ sets up his eternal kingdom, and that's what the plan of salvation is all about, so that we could be a part of it. And it says, they start in antiquity and they go through history up to the present and to the future when Christ returns and God establishes his eternal kingdom. Read John 14, 29. What does Jesus say that helps us to understand prophecy? And now I have told you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you may believe. That's an incredible advantage that we have because Amen. we're living in the times, I believe, of the soon return of Jesus Christ. We can look back and say Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome. And then Papal. fragmented Europe. Fragmented Europe. That's exactly right. We can see that all these prophecies have been fulfilled. And then Christ in Matthew 24, Luke chapter 21, Mark chapter 13 gives us incredible details about the signs of when he's actually coming. And we can see that he is coming very, very soon. On to uh, Monday's lesson. It says here, one of the interpretive keys of historicism is the year-day year day principle. Many scholars throughout the centuries applied this principle to the time prophecies of Daniel and Revelation. They derived the principle from several key texts, and we're going to look at a couple of them right now. Rebecca, if you could read for us Numbers 14.34 and Ezekiel 4, verse 6. Okay, the New King James Version says, verse four, uh, Numbers 14.34, According to the number of the days in which you spied out the land, 40 days, for each day you shall bear your guilt one year, namely 40 years, and you shall know my rejection. So right there in that verse, you have the application of one day, equals one year. year. 40 days equals 40 years. That's equal four, six. And when you have completed them, lie again on your right side. Then you shall bear the iniquity of the house of Judah 40 days. I have laid on you a day for each year. Now remember, we're in Monday's lesson, and it says in these texts, we can see very clearly the idea or the principle of the year day principle. But how do we justify using this principle? such as Daniel 7.22 and Daniel 8.14, as well as Daniel 11.23, etc. Let's look at those verses for just a moment. He will speak out against the Most High and wear down the saints of the highest one, and he will indeed intend to make alterations in times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand for a time, times, and a half a time. Well, what does a time, times, and a half a time mean? If you apply the day, uh, year day principle, you will see that it actually makes sense. Daniel 8.14 was the memory text that Rebecca read just a moment ago. And he said to me, for 2,300 days, then shall, shall the sanctuary be cleansed. If you, if you interpret those to be literal days, the interpretation doesn't make sense. It's just, it just doesn't make sense. But, but if you the apply the year. day year principle, it makes perfect sense. If you uh, go down a little further, it says three other elements support the year-day principle. And these prophecies, the use of symbols, long time periods, and peculiar expressions. Read that next paragraph, Rebecca. First, the symbolic nature of the beast and horns representing kingdoms suggests that the time expressions also should be understood as symbolic. The beasts and horns are not to be taken literally. They are symbols for something else. Hence, because the rest of prophecy is symbolic, not literal. Why should we take the prime uh, time prophecies alone as literal? The answer, of course, 
is that we shouldn't. So if the rest of the prophecy is, is symbolic, why are we going to make, why would we make the time prophecy uh, literal? So the whole idea is if you look at the context of the prophecy itself, it's all symbolic. So should the interpretation of the time. Read the next paragraph. Second, many of the events and kingdoms depicted in the prophecies cover a time span of many centuries, which would be impossible if the time prophecies depicting them were taken literally. Once the year-day principle is applied, the time fits the events in a remarkably accurate way, something that would be impossible if the time prophecies were taken literally. That's right. If you if you take a close look at the these time prophecies and apply them with the day year principle, they fit historical events perfectly. If you apply it just as literal days, literal time, uh, then they don't fit. Okay. If you read the next point, Rebecca. Finally, the peculiar. Finally, the peculiar expressions used to designate these time periods suggest a symbolic interpretation. In other words, the ways in which time is expressed in these prophecies, for example, the 2300 evenings and mornings of Daniel 8.14, are not the normal ways to express time, showing us that the time periods depicted are to be taken symbolically not literally. Amen. Let's move on to Tuesday's lesson, identifying the little horn. So let's see what we could do in terms of identifying the little horn. For centuries, the Protestant reformers identified the little horn pyre of Daniel 7 and Daniel 8 as the Roman church. Why? We Seventh-day Adventists also follow that interpretation. Some other denominations do, all of them really, Protestants used to, but now they've fallen away from that because they have left or abandoned this historicist view of interpretation. And they've adopted, frankly, some uh, Roman Catholic interpretations of uh, prophecy. And of course, the Roman Catholics will point the finger away from identifying the papacy as the, um, A little horn. as the little horn. So it says in Daniel 7, verses 1 to 25, and Daniel 8, verses 1 to 13, what are the common characteristics of the little horn in these chapters? Again, we don't have time to read the entire chapter because that's what we're being asked to do, almost, much of the chapter. But if you study the lesson, you will see that there are seven common characteristics. Well, first of all, they're beasts. That's right. Uh, both of them describe, are described as a horn. Both are persecuting powers. Both are self-exalting and blasphemous. Both target God's people. Both have aspects of their activity delineated by prophetic time. So if you look at the time period, apply it in the historicist way of interpreting, it all fits in. Both extend into the end of time. And both are supernaturally destroyed. In other words, God has a hand in history. We as Christians, we as Seventh-day Adventists, believe that. And you see that affirmed in the study of prophecy as interpreted with the historicist view. Read that next paragraph. History identifies. History identifies the first kingdom as Babylon in Daniel 2.38. The second is Medo-Persia in Daniel 8.20. The third is Greece, Daniel 8.21. History is unequivocal that after these world empires comes Rome. Go ahead with the next paragraph. In Daniel 2, the iron representing Rome continues into the feet of iron mixed with clay. That is, until the end of time. The little horn of Daniel 7 comes forth from the fourth beast, but remains part of this fourth beast. So in Daniel 2 and Daniel 7, actually what you see, if you look at it carefully, they are parallel prophecies. Daniel 2 gives a broad stroke outline in history. Daniel 7 covers the same ground, but gives us different details. So in other details. words, it's like, look at it. Now look at it again. That's right. My, uh, Rebecca, you are an artist. If you're making a painting, often what you will do is you will do broad strokes 
initially put the outline of the painting together and then you go back and you put in the details. You add more detail as you continue with your painting. What power comes out of Rome and, and continues its politico religious influence for at least 1,260 1, years? Only one power fits history of prophecy. It is called the papacy. That's right. And what does the papacy mean? Well, it means that there is one man over a system of belief on earth, and uh, the Pope is considered to be the head and uh, a vicar or in place of Christ That's right. on earth. Several years ago, uh, you and I visited Rome, mm -hmm. and near the center of Rome is a small city-state the it's, Vatican. It's called the Vatican. And we visited the Vatican. You literally cross the street. On one side of the street, you're in the city of Rome. You cross the street and you're in the city state. The papal state. The papal state of the Vatican. Mm -hmm. And who rules the Vatican? Who's in charge? The Pope. The Pope. That's exactly right. Only one power is the papacy. The papacy came into power amongst the 10 barbarian tribes of Europe and uprooted three of them. The papacy was different from the previous ones, indicating the uniqueness compared to the other tribes. The papacy spoke pompous words against the Most High and exalted himself as high as the Prince of the Host. What does it mean, pompous words? What does pompous words mean? Well, bragging. Bragging, okay. I'm the, I'm the guy in charge. I'm the one that's superior. Only I'm, me. Only me. Me. He, he usurped the, claimed to usurp the role of Jesus and replacing it with the Pope. The papacy fulfilled the prediction of persecuting the saints of the Most High and casting down some of the host, Daniel 8.10, Daniel 7.25, during the Counter-Reformation when Protestants were slaughtered. So there was the Reformation, and then there was the Counter-Reformation. In other words... And we've the, heard of the Inquisition. The papacy, the supporters of Rome, rose up against those Protestants and went about to destroy them. Remember... Many of the Protestant reformers were killed. Some were burned, some were crucified, some were killed in a variety of ways. And many fleed to the New World. Fled. They, they did. Fled. Fled. The, Fleed. <laughs> that's what my cat does. The, yes. pa the, the papacy sought to change times and law by removing the second commandment and changing the Sabbath to the Sunday. Sunday. Now, the second commandment has to do with thou shalt not bow down to any or make unto thyself a graven image or bow down and worship it. We know that our Roman Catholic friends uh, often will worship images of Mary and other types of images. And so that command was removed conveniently. And the fourth commandment was basically, uh, the, the, the fourth commandment was changed to the so-called third commandment, and it was shortened. In Daniel 2 and Daniel 7 and 8, after Greece, one power arises that exists to the end of time. What power could that be other than Rome, now in its papal stage? No matter how politically incorrect, why is this crucial teaching of the three angels' messages, and hence a crucial component of present truth? Seventh Adventists teach the three angels' messages is found in Revelation chapter 14. In Revelation chapter 14, you find these teachings that we're talking about here. And clearly, uh, the, uh, the third angel's message about receiving the mark of the beast. If you study that out, put it in this historical context, compare scripture with scripture, you will see that the papacy uh, figure is large there. You look at Wednesday's lesson, moving along, the investigative judgment. Now this, all of this is extremely important. I'm glad we're having this lesson today because this is foundational to what Christians and Seventh-day Adventists believe. The investigative judgment. When Adam and Eve sinned, the Bible says that they went and they hid themselves. They knew that they were naked. They had been clothed with, a, with what we believe was uh, the, the white, bright uh, light, which was a ro robe of righteousness provided by God himself. When they sinned, they became naked, and they went out and they made themselves clothing from fig leaves, and they hid themselves from God when he came searching for them. And, and God asked the simple question, where art thou, Adam? Where are you? And uh, God asked several questions. He was conducting what's called an investigation, an investigative judgment. If you go downtown to Albuquerque to the federal courtroom, 
of Albuquerque, you go to the federal courthouse, you go to the county courthouse, uh, the city, there's always before someone is convicted of a crime, an investigation if it should be done, if it is done fairly. Evidence is presented. That's what happens in an investigative judgment. Before uh, God pronounces judgment upon this world and destroys the world by fire and the wicked are destroyed in that fire, God will conduct a judgment. When does that judgment begin? What are the elements of that judgment? Well, we believe that's found in these prophecies. The prophetic outline study this week has found overwhelming support among Protestant historicists since the Reformation. But it was not until the Millerite movement in the early 1800s, speaking of William Miller, a Baptist preacher, in the early 1800s that the 2300 days of the investigative judgment were carefully reconsidered and studied. And it says, look at this chart. And by and the way, you have your. Um quarterly take a moment to look at it and if you don't have it just think of uh the golden image of of uh uh, uh nebuchadnezzar. nebuchadnezzar uh we have the head of gold babylon Medo persia the silver uh greece the uh bronze and then pagan rome the iron so we have this lin lin linear thinking ex uh, presented again, but this time in the form of beasts. In Daniel uh, 8. Yeah, Daniel 7 is lion, bear, leopard, right. and uh, a fourth beast with many little horns. And then Daniel 8, of course, uh, will uh, have not only the head of gold, but uh, Medo-Persia, which is the ram, and Greece, which is a he-goat, and then pagan Rome, and papal Rome. So yes, by the time you get to Daniel eight, Babylon is passed but off the scene. But it's all the same. It's it's all the same linear prophecy. There you go. That's good. And by the way, it says twenty three hundred days there, and if you apply the day year principle, it's two thousand three hundred years. And by the way, it makes sense. It says uh, here after the period of medieval persecution, which ended in seventeen ninety eight with the capture and imprisonment of the Pope by Napoleon's general Berthier. Uh, Daniel 7 and 8 speak of judgment. By the way, the name Daniel, <coughs> Daniel means God is my judge, okay? And um, and we find the judgment is clearly delineated and spoken of uh, in the book of Daniel. Okay, the judgment is to take place in heaven where the court was seated. One like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven came to the Ancient of Days, Daniel 7, 13. This is a judgment scene that occurs after 1798 and before the second coming of Jesus. If you, if you begin in uh, 458 BC and you trace uh, 2,300 years, you come to the year 1844. And you will see that uh, the judgment begins. The judgment scene. And so that's the importance of our memory verse. That's right. This is a judgment scene that occurs after 1798 and before the second coming of Jesus. Read the next paragraph. The judgment scene in Daniel. Is directly parallel to the cleansing of the sanctuary in Daniel 8.14. They are talking about the same thing. According to Daniel 8.14, the time of this cleansing of the sanctuary, which is the Day of Atonement terminology, is 2300 evenings, mornings, or days. With the year-day principle, these days represent 2,300 years, 2,300 years. Listen carefully. By the way, this is the first time you've heard this. We have a detailed Bible study that we can give you to you at the church. Come by, and we'll put one in your hands. The starting point of the 2,300 years is found in Daniel 9, verse 24, in which the 70-week or 490-year prophecy is cut off from the 2300 day vision. In fact, many scholars correctly say the 2300 day or year prophecy and the 70 week prophecy as two parts of one prophecy. The next verse in the 70 week prophecy of Daniel 9 25 gives the beginning of the time period from the going forth of the command to restore and to build Jerusalem. The date of this event is the seventh year of Artaxerxes the king, or 457, 457 BC. BC. If you take that as a starting point, 
and you count for it forward 2,300 years, taking into account there's no zero year, because that's, that's artificial, which is not long after 70, you come to 1844, which is not long after 1798. And before the second coming of Jesus, this is when Jesus entered into the most holy place and began his work of intercession and of cleansing the heavenly sanctuary. And to 2,300 years, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. That's right. So this is a very important uh, verse. It tells us what Jesus is doing in investigative judgment judgment and when he began doing it don't we want to know more about jesus what he's doing why he's doing it when he's doing it how he's doing it isn't god good that he tells us these things that's right way back in the book of exodus god said to moses and let them make me a sanctuary that i may dwell amongst them the sanctuary provided an outline or guide to the plan of salvation they were and good. the ministry of Jesus. And the ministry of Jesus. Thank you. That's that's crucial. And so uh, there was a role that the people had to play. They were to bring sacrifices. And there was blood that was shed, and that represented a point forward to the blood that Jesus shed on the cross for you and me. If you march through the sanctuary from the door of the sanctuary all the way into the most holy place of the sanctuary, there you have outlined the various stages of the plan of salvation. When you get to the most holy place, that's where you have the sanctuary being cleansed. Remember, blood is, is brought on a daily basis, and at some point, something has to happen to that blood. Well, some people believe that at the cross, that was all taken care of. But if you study the Hebrew sanctuary, you will see that there was more that's to it. That's part of the process. That's part of the process, and um, you'll see that the sanctuary actually was cleansed, and that represented the judgment before Jesus returns. He says, when he comes in Revelation chapter 22, my reward is with me to give every man according to his work. And you'll find that in Revelation chapter 22. Okay, moving on to the next Thursday's lesson, typology as prophecy. The symbols of apocalyptic, let me just pause for a second. What I just covered, what I just said about the sanctuary and about um, judgment. There is an entire study or two or three or four that we can place in your hands if you come by the church. We'll be happy to give you those. We have copies of those lessons at the church. Because don't we want to understand Jesus and his ministry more and more every day? By the way, if you study the Hebrew sanctuary carefully, you'll discover exactly where Jesus is right now and what he's doing. Is he sitting in a rocking chair? Maybe drinking some mint tea? Um, you know, just occasionally thinking about us? Or is he actively involved in taking care of us and protecting us and working for us? And, and preparing his kingdom and for us. And preparing his kingdom for us. Remember, he says before he returns, he will, he's preparing a mansion for us, right? He's preparing a place for us to live. In other words, preparing a place where we can be with him and live with him forever. The symbols of apocalyptic Thursday's lesson prophecies such as those found in Daniel and Revelation, have one single fulfillment. For example, the he-goat found in fulfillment in Greece found its fulfillment in Greece a singular kingdom. After all, the text came right out and named it for us. How much clearer could be? In other words, each symbol had a singular, single interpretation. In other words, there were not multiple possible interpretations of one particular symbol. And again, it's simplified, it's clear, it's easy. A child, and by the way, children study these things out and they understand And them. love to study. For example, the ego. After all, the text came right out. Typology, however, focuses on actual persons, events, or institutions of the Old Testament that are founded in a historical reality, but that point forward to greater reality in the future. The use of typology as a method of interpretation goes back to Jesus and the New Testament writers and is even found in the Old Testament itself. The only guide to recognizing a type and anti-type is when an inspired writer of Scripture identifies it. It says, read 1 Corinthians 10, verses 1 to 13. Go ahead and read that. It's a long passage, but it's worth reading. 1 Corinthians 10, verses 1 through 13. Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea 
all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with most of them, God was not well pleased for their bodies. <laughs> We've got a cat that's <laughs> visiting us. He's joining us. Yes. Um, but most of them, uh, but with most of them, God was not well pleased for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now these now these things became our examples to the extent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted and do not become idolaters as were some of them as it is written the people shall sit down to eat and drink and rose up to play nor let us commit sexual immorality as some of them did and in one day 23,000 fell, nor let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by serpents, nor complain as some of them also complain and were destroyed by the destroyer. That's good. Let's stop right there. So we can see that this passage refers to several historical events in the Bible. The first passage that Rebecca read from the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 refers to the Exodus. Uh, and, and so there's several examples there that are given. Then we have the giving of the law and the, um, that the rock was Christ, the idolatry of the children of Israel. They made the golden calf, etc. So Paul, uh, admonishes the Corinthian church by pointing out, Paul refers back to the historical reality of the Exodus and develops the typology based on the experience of the ancient Hebrews in the wilderness. And this way, Paul shows that God who inspired Moses to record these events intended these things become our examples, thereby admonishing spiritual Israel to endure temptation in the last days, pointing back to what happened in the past, the type and the greater fulfillment at the close of time. Right. And it's very important too. therefore let him who thinks he stands, take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man, but God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the, the, the temptation will also make the way of escape, that, that you, you may be, be able, able to, to bear, bear it. Amen. That's a special message. That's a powerful promise. Well, that's a very special message for uh, the, the investigative judgment. That's right. That's right. He who began a work, a good work in us, is faithful to complete it. That's right. Matthew 12, 40 says, Jesus speaking, for just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So here we have the uh, literal fulfilled later on in a larger context there. So if you look at John 19, 36, read that one for us, Rebecca. For these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled. Not one of his bones shall be broken. So it says, read the passages below and write down each type and antitype fulfillment. So John 3, verses 14 to 15. Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. So Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. Jesus became sin for us. Yeah, that was Jesus the took our sins. So the symbol was the serpent lifted up in the wilderness. <laughs> and the actual was Jesus That's right. lifted up on the cross. Romans 5, 14. Nevertheless, day, death reigned from Adam until Moses, uh, even over those who have not sinned in the likeness of the offense of Adam, who is a type of him who, who is to come. So Adam was a type of Christ. Christ. Jesus, Paul refers to as the second Adam. John 1, 29. Read that one for us, Rebecca. So that's a pretty clear one. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And who is the Lamb of God? Jesus. That's right. By the way, going back to the sanctuary typology, when the priest of the household, the husband, the father, he would bring a lamb, for example, to the gate of the sanctuary. And he was, he was given a knife. He would take the life of the little lamb and blood would be spilled. That lamb represented? Jesus. That's right. The type met its fulfillment at the cross, Jesus Christ himself. He saw, uh, John the Baptist saw Jesus Christ. In each case, Jesus and the New Testament writers apply the type and the antitype 
interpretation that allow the prophetic significance to stand out. In this way, they point to a greater fulfillment of the historical reality. Let's go to Friday's lesson, and it says here, um, I think we can close right there. I'd encourage you to read Friday's lesson, but I think we're we're okay. Well, we can skip over that. Okay. I think we've run out of time now. So um, we're going to uh, bring our lesson to conclusion at this time. I hope you've enjoyed it and, and, and re received some enlightenment, some understanding. I know in studying and preparing it myself, I got some fresh insights myself. Rebecca, um, any closing thoughts? Well, it's, I think it's very, very important that we understand uh, just exactly why it's important that we understand the fullness of Jesus' ministry. We have the gospel message, but uh, to really understand the fullness of the gospel, we need to understand Christ's ministry. And one of the most rewarding studies you can ever do is to understand the sanctuary. And for us right now, one of the most important uh, scriptures uh, regarding the sanctuary is to unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. So it's very important that we understand the prophecies, the scriptures, and what they mean to us as human beings on this earth today. There you go. And to put it in a slightly different context, we know, according to Jesus, that wickedness will increase and deceptions will increase in the last days. That's another reason why we should uh, avoid a, a lot of heartache in being deceived by studying God's word and, and interpreting the scriptures correctly. Um, a reminder, 11 o'clock, Sabbath, June the 13th, we will have a live service. Uh, Sabbath school, of course, is recorded. You're, you're hearing it now. Uh, you come to the drive through between 11, 11 and, 12. and 12. You can drop off your tithes and offerings, and you can also pick up Sabbath school lessons. So if you don't wish to go in or if it's not safe for you to go in, if you're over 65, uh, Please feel free to come to the drive through We'll be waving, taking up your offering, and you can still make that uh, contact. That's right. Let's have closing prayer. Rebecca, if you could offer a short prayer for us. Certainly. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for your goodness to us. We're so thankful that we have a sure word of prophecy. We don't have to wonder. We don't have to guess. We don't have to be confused like Nebuchadnezzar was because we have interpretation. We have understanding that uh, the pr prophecies uh, are linear, that we can follow them through history. And uh, through careful Bible study, we can understand understand your ministry and what you are doing and Lord that you are coming soon save us in your kingdom and keep us in your goodness in Jesus name we pray amen amen thanks everyone happy Sabbath we'll see you again soon